a show about making bold statements in the garden coming up right after this. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now, have I got a show for you today. We're talking about bold statements in the garden. And just take a look at this as an example. This is a small room at the Chicago Botanic Garden, one of many. And look at this horticultural display, three different plants. We've got loose strife in each corner and in the center. And then there's purple heliotrope that creates a grid here and in between a pink begonia. And to echo the chartreuse color of this Lismachia or loose strife is this beautiful arch in golden hops. But first we're going to take a trip to the northeast and visit some fantastic gardens that are just breathtaking. Plus we'll check out this incredible tropical bulb container. Then I'll show you a new area in my garden that's designed specifically for insects. And I have this delicious recipe I want to share with you as well. So as you can see, we have a lot to cover in today's show. So let's get started. Okay, take a look at this garden again. It's really a knot garden, a classic, really old idea of intertwining plants to create a beautiful pattern. And here they've used all annuals. I'll go through them one more time. The Lismachia, the purple heliotrope, and the pink begonia. Pretty cool idea, huh? So why don't we head to the Hamptons where I saw another knot garden last year which resonates beautifully with this idea. Come on, let's go. A garden that has a formal design in a square frame and grown with a variety of aromatic plants and culinary herbs is often called a knot garden. Rick Bogush, garden manager of Bridge Gardens in Bridgehampton, New York, tells us all about this interesting space. Rick, I can't believe how the knot garden has come on it just in 10 days. I was here 10 days ago and gosh, it's a huge amount of growth. Well, we've had a little bit of heat since you were here last and I think that's really brought on the plants. Well, it's just exceptional. Look at the lavender, it's really showing out. Yes, it's really, it's really at its peak right now. This is really one of the, um, I guess, stars in the crown at Bridge Gardens. Yeah, I think it's one of our most popular gardens. I'd say it's also our most complete garden now at this yeah. point. Yeah. So it is a classic uh, herb garden design. And we have uh, a culinary bed, a medicinal bed. Now this, this is the culinary, I guess, because of the fennel. These are the culinary <laughs> herbs, right, yes. Right. And uh, lots of your, your old favorites, basil and thyme and oregano and sage yeah, and so forth. Yeah, yeah. And then we also have a medicinal bed over there, tansy, self-heal. certainly see some achillea there. Uh, yes, uh, yes a, a classic medicinal herb and some not so classic ones too. And uh, in the back we have uh, our textile and, and dye herbs uh, beds and then we have what we call ornamental herbs over there, kind of a miscellany. Well, with all the diversity, I can see how these central plants, I'll, I'll call them the framework plants, such as the boxwood, the barberry, and the lavender, uh, help hold the garden together. Yes, they definitely anchor the garden throughout the year, uh, summer and winter. Rick, I gotta applaud you on the boxwood garland that you're clipping into this hedge. I mean, I, I, where do you find the time? Well, it, it takes about a whole day just to do the boxwood and you have to use scissors and little grass shears, uh, but I, I, it's worth it, it really is. It's a, it's a very unique look for a boxwood hedge. It, it is totally unique. I've never seen it before and I I love the way the garlands crisscross across the top. Yes. I really like the way you've used the, the shells as a mulch in the center part of the bed. Yeah, it's a, again, very unusual. You don't see shells used as a mulch very often, but we thought it was uh, appropriate for here at the east end of Long Island uh, to use that. Yeah, this is just phenomenal, Rick. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Alan. And thanks for sharing it with us. You're very welcome. Jack Larson is legendary in the world of textile design, but did you also know that he's a gardener? 
In fact, he's a very enthusiastic gardener with an eye for design. While on my trip to New York, I sat down with Jack and had a talk about what sparked his interest in gardening. I've known you for some time and, and over the years I have learned that one of the joys for you about this place is sharing it. Exactly. Well, I couldn't imagine doing it without uh, the idea that someone else is going to come along and, and uh, get s something out of it that uh, otherwise it w would, would be totally a madness. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, you've traveled all over the world and seen many countries and many cultures in your lifetime and you continue to do so. Is there one of those cultures or countries that you feel ha has, has influenced you more over the others? Japan is that, but it did as I was growing up and particularly I was in art school in Seattle because the culture was very pro-Japanese even after the war. Our architecture and painters and uh, had lived there and liked it and I grew up with that. Where can we see influences at Longhouse Reserve? I mean, I immediately think of the entry gates. Uh, that, but the whole house is uh, inspired by Issei Shrine, which is seventh century. It's rather pre-Japanese style with the massive roof and up on stilts. Regarding the influence of Japan on your aesthetic, um, do I see that in the way you place objects both in the house and, and in the garden? Because you have a keen sense of spatial relationships. I practiced it all the time and I think it's great fun and I think uh, that more people could do that. Um, that they make the bed every day, they set the table every day. Uh, try it different ways, uh, uh, make, it, make it more interesting. And I do that, I, uh, whether it's arranging yarns or flowers or whatever, um, it's good practice. The proverb I liked best was, be an open bowl that some opportunity may fall in. <laughs> and uh, that's worked very well for us. Well, it certainly has. <laughs> Okay, I admit it, I'm not big on filling my home with a jungle of tropical houseplants, but I do enjoy mixing them in the garden with more traditional plants. While on a trip to the Northeast, a tropical display with massive elephant ears caught my attention. A.R. Wiley tells me what he did to this tropical container design to give it so much bold impact. You know, A.R., I don't think you can underestimate the power of foliage, particularly gorgeous foliage like this. These are some outstanding caladiums. Well, we find caladiums are just a terrific plant to use in the container, even in the garden, and th they really provide a lot of pizzazz. Well, there's so many different varieties. I mean, I, I was flipping through a catalog recently and just saw that, I mean, there's just literally hundreds of varieties of these leaf formations. There are, there are quite a few. And for the person who is trying to figure out what to grow in, a, in an almost no light situation, deep shade, that's a great example great in the shade and because of the light color it really reflects the light underneath a, a tree very yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, it really illuminates those yeah. spaces. You know, I, th I think tropicals by and large are, are often are overlooked. I, I can't believe the size of this elephant ear behind you. Well, it is a very bold plant and really it makes a terrific statement in a, in a container. It's amazing to me that you can take one of those huge elephant ear bulbs, plant it in a container in the spring, and in several weeks you've got that sort of dramatic display. It, Here's another example of foliage, the coleus, that's echoing the same greens that you have in those elephant ears. That's just outstanding. As you know, AR, I've got a neighbor who actually has planted tons of these around the house, and it is really dramatic. What are some of the other varieties or, or I just, let's just say tropical well, foliage plants that you, you see are popular here? Well, we use a lot with the ginger and we also do a lot, again, with the caladiums and uh, a lot of the other bold foliaged uh, tropicals that we yeah. bring in. A lot of people don't realize it, but you can actually grow cannas in standing water. Yeah, and the additional benefit is that cannas do flower and you get beautiful colors, yellows and oranges and reds. Yeah, I, I, they're just such a dramatic and bold plant in the landscape or in a container. Yes. 
Now, some of the other uh, blooming tropicals that, that I use, um, I'm crazy about agapanthus, for instance. Lily of the Nile is a beautiful plant, and it comes in blues and whites, and it's a, it's a great container plant also. Yeah, and it's tough. I mean, it really takes the heat. It takes the heat, as most of your tropicals just love it, the, yeah. the hot summer days. Well, you know, something that I've been growing and actually saw for the first time in, in England, and then I saw it growing in fields in Holland, is, is, is crocosmia. A great, great plant. Yeah, those colors, uh, the oranges and the hot reds are just stunning, absolutely stunning. And then, then the, a, a novelty that we've grown is the pineapple lily or eucomus. Yes, we've had that and it's a terrific, terrific plant. Yeah, it's, it's funny to see people's reactions to it because it does look like a little tiny looks pineapple. looks like a tiny pineapple at come, the end of the come, stalk. Coming out of there, that's great. You know, the thing about all of these bulbs and tubers that are, that are tropical is that they really are easy to grow. They're very easy to grow. They love the heat of the summer and they're terrific plants in either containers or in beds and especially around swimming pools. Yeah, these are all great ideas. Keep up the good work. Alan, thank you very much for coming. We enjoyed it. I want to show you something I'm very excited about. It's this long bed of blooming flowers. It has a purpose, you see. It's an insectary. Now, what an insectary is all about, it's about providing support for good bugs. You see, out here in my vegetable garden, every day, it's all out war. It's good bugs against bad bugs. And by having an insectary, you're supporting the good bug population. You see, it's a green way of dealing with pests. So what I have here is quite a blend of flowers that uh, actually support a lot of the beneficial insects that we have out here. You see, beneficial insects are divided into three lifestyles, if you will. First, you have the predators, uh, like a ladybug. Ladybugs love to eat aphids. And then you have what are called parasitoids. For instance, there's a little wasp called a trichogramma wasp. It lays its eggs within the eggs of a bad bug. The little wasp hatches out as a larva and then eats the egg that it has been laid in, destroying the bad bug population. Pretty cool, huh? Then the third category of beneficial insects is among the pollinators. So those include bees and butterflies and a lot of things that we're familiar with that help transfer pollen from one flower to the next. Now, if you want to create an environment that's attractive to these beneficials, you need to know that they need water, for instance. A good source of water, it can be in the form of a bird bath or just pools of water. It's important. Second, mulch. Having some mulch where some of them can get up under during the day and come out at night is very helpful. And then a food source, and that's what this insectary is all about. And in the insectary, you want a lot of diversity. You see, in the natural world, diversity is a good thing. I mean, in here, you can see zinnias, big ones and little ones, and cosmos and marigolds and sunflowers, fennel and dill, as well as buckwheat. Now, what you need to know is that you don't have to have an insectary this large. Diversity is the key, but you don't have to make it this big. You see, this is eight by 80 feet. Of course, we're serving insects for a full acre vegetable garden. You might think that this requires a lot of work. Well, actually, it just took tilling up the soil, adding in some good amendment, some organic fertilizer, and we just sowed the seeds. And look what happened in just four to five weeks. You can see that virtually every seed germinated, and now they're coming into full bloom. Now, the thing to keep in mind when you're trying to attract beneficials to your garden Using pesticides is a no-no because you see the pesticide doesn't know the difference between a good bug and a bad bug. It kills everything. So that's why it's important to attract the good bugs and let the good bugs take care of the bad bugs. You know, this quail is so good this time of year. What do you think, Peter? That looks perfect. That Absolutely looks perfect. Right. Nicely Let's dredged. There we go. All right. Now, I'm here with my friend Peter Brave, and he is creating one of my favorite recipes that he serves in his restaurant, Brave New. 
It's a gorgeous quail recipe and it's so easy. So what's next, Peter? Well, we've marinated this quail for about four or five hours in right. a little mirepoix, some red wine, and some olive oil, a little cracked black pepper. Uh, go ahead and let those flavors marry. Uh, and then after you slightly dredged it there and just straight flour, uh, I've got a very hot skillet here. I'm gonna add a little bit of olive oil to it. That's one of the things the home cooks have a tendency to cook not at high enough temperatures in my estimation, yeah. uh, just because you want a nice searing and uh, it quickly seals in the flavors and the juices. Okay. I'm gonna carefully go ahead and put this quail in here and let him start to go ahead and sear. Mm -hmm. All right, now you can tell just by the way it's sizzling like that, it's a very nice hot skillet. Yeah. And uh, it's gonna create a little bit of a crust. The skin's gonna go ahead and start to mix with that oil, mm -hmm. a little flour and seasonings that Locking we put on in there. those flavors. Absolutely, it'll make it stay nice and moist. So this is also gonna kind of demonstrate a couple of little different techniques that I think are fun. I'm trying to kind of rotate the oil around in the skillet so it doesn't get too hot in one place. Otherwise, yeah, you run the risk of it good. getting a little burnt. Right, uh, right. Which you want it nice and golden brown, but you don't want it to have any of the extra too dark of a color. You so scooting the quail around, and on one side, how long? Probably about 30 or 45 seconds. Um, and as we're doing this, like I said, constantly moving around, some of that flour and the, the, some of the stuff from the quail is gonna go ahead and come out and make a little bit of a fond. Yep, there we go, look Beautiful. at that. Beautiful, golden oh, brown. Gorgeous. Now, what I'm gonna do is, this is a nice little trick, an oven-proof handle. I've got an oven at 400 degrees over here. We'll go ahead and put that in there. Leaving it in the oil. Leaving it in the oil and in the skillet and everything. That's a little technique that the restaurant people use a whole lot because you don't have to monitor it. You're getting heat from all sides instead of just from below. Uh, and it allows me, if I was in the restaurant, I would be using this time to prep the plate, put the vegetables on the plate or something like that. So very good. Uh, a very nice little restaurant trick to go ahead and utilize in the home kitchen for sure. Well, it is, it is such a delicious recipe. And you know, it's, it's the, the fact that you've used this mirepoix uh, to help season it. Now, the classic mirepoix is just simply carrots and some celery and onion and so forth. Absolutely, it's about a 50% onion, 25% carrot, 25% celery ratio. Well, let me go ahead and check on this that's, quail. That's great. It only takes about a minute and a half. Um, I'm loving learning your secrets here. We love sharing with y'all. Mm. So, okay, now this one, I mean, we did nice real time here and it was only in there about a minute and a half. Right. And one of the things I think people fail to realize is that when you're doing something like this, you're gonna pull the quail out nice and crispy, golden mm -hmm. brown, just beautiful. It was boneless to begin with, and so it's gonna go ahead and it's gonna cook very fast initially. Now I've got this, whatever's the flour and the oil that's in here, I'm gonna go ahead and just dump this out. Right. The skillet that's got a little bit of the flour and a little bit of what they call the fond on the bottom. Right. Now I wanna very carefully pour this away from me because we're gonna probably get some good flames Crackling, here. Yeah. There we go, nice. So that was Beautiful. a little bit of red wine. We're deglazing, getting all the things. And when you do this at home, home, be careful. <laughs> then I've got a little bit of chicken stock right here. Yeah. All right, we're gonna add that. And then I've got about a tablespoon of lingonberries. Lingonberries mm -hmm. is kind of a fun berry that comes in uh, mm -hmm. uh, primarily out of uh, the Scandinavian region. Yeah. Uh, you could substitute cranberries very easily. Yeah, to yeah. Do, uh, do a cranberries like this. So now what I've got is just a little bit of a pan skillet sauce. I'm gonna go ahead and roll it around. You can see yeah. the hot sauce is gonna go ahead and continue to reduce down. As it reduces down, it'll get more and more of a, of a sauce-like consistency. And right when it gets to about where I want it, I'm gonna fold in a little bit of whole butter and I'm gonna fold in some of these beautiful uh, flat leaf parsley and this beautiful uh, uh, leaf thyme, thyme yeah. that came right off the back porch out here. Yep. So right. we're getting close here. I'm gonna go ahead and fold Now would this, this be butter. enough sauce for one quail, Peter? Um, or, or a couple? It would probably work for a couple. This recipe could very easily, when the size of the skillet and all that kind of stuff, you could double it up. Well, and I would want that much sure. for one quail. It looks delicious. It is going to make a wonderful sauce. Mm -hmm. And that butter, what it does is it adds a little bit of sheen to the sauce, a little bit of shine <laughs> it sure to it. Does. And it uh, Not also, to mention the flavor. It adds a lot of flavor to it, no doubt about it. So you can see how that all folds in. And you know, we did this in real time, and I mean, we're talking about less than five minutes, basically, from start to finish. Yeah. You want to marinate your quail, obviously, for ahead of time, but you could do that. Again, how long was the was it marinated? About four hours, yeah. uh, I'd say at least. You could do it up to overnight. You do it much farther than that, it has a tendency to be a little bit too overpowering. Yeah, it looks like estimation. we're about ready here. Absolutely. So we've got That's that sauce fantastic. reduced down, nice, done. And we'll just pour that right over that quail, mm. and there you have it. Uh, a simple beautiful fresh quail with a, a, a pan sauce with lingonberries uh, and a little bit of the fresh herbs. Well, as soon as it cools off, I'm gonna taste it. Thank you so much it's for sharing pleasure, your Alan. recipe. It's always a pleasure to have you out here at the farm. Well, thank you very much for having me.
Welcome to my design studio. Today we're taking a look at a house in North Carolina. It's charming. It belongs to Melinda. What I love about this, it's a classic house. Um, I love the portico or porch and the use of the brick. It's very, very nice, Melinda. Now, a couple of things that I would say right from the beginning that we probably need to take care of. These uh, hedges have gotten really too tall and they look like they may be yew hedge. It's a beautiful evergreen. But I, what I would do is I would cut them down below the window like this and maybe let them come up a little higher on the ends. And the same way over here, you can see how it's grown up well above the window. So we want to take care of that for sure. So let me go ahead and erase that bit. And let's start with some ideas. One of the first things I would do here is think about enclosure. It looks like you're really close to the street. So um, one, one thing that might be kind of nice would be to put a picket fence here with a gate. It would add a lot of charm and let this run across the front of the house like this and uh, do it in white. And um, this would be an opportunity. We're far enough out from the house that you could grow a beautiful rose on this um, picket fence. If you stepped back, you could plant some roses across the front. But I suggest that since you have limited space there, that you bring the fence right up to the edge of your sidewalk or the road. It's a little hard to tell. And then here you can create a, a pair of gates or you don't even have to have gates, but um, I like gates that would allow people to come through them. It just creates a beautiful sense of entry. Then on the back side, I would do something classic. Behind here, I would do a boxwood on the other side, back behind, and it looks like you have lavender planted, Melinda, along this pathway. It's a beautiful idea, but a lot of North Carolina is very, very acidic, and so by um, you're gonna be struggling with lavender, and I would suggest that you use something like uh, cat mint. It, it does very well for me. I grow one called Walker's Low at the farm that does, does very well. Or Six Hills Giant is another variety and has those beautiful frothy uh, lavender colored blooms. Okay, now if we move a little closer to the house, I think I would repeat this boxwood back up here on either side of the containers. I like the size of the container that you have. You could actually go a little larger if you wanted to. And then you've got some azaleas here, which I think, and it's a good choice, but I would carry those all the way across in front of these U's like this, all the way across for continuity. And you have some hosta here. I would take one variety of hosta. You could divide the one that you have, but I would get one that has really tall, beautiful flower spikes and you can go to your local garden center for that. And what I would do is I would make an entire bed of hosta all the way across the front of these azaleas. And it would just be spectacular through the entire growing season. So just remember, we need to cut these down, Melinda. Let them come up like that. Think about enclosing it just a bit with the picket fence and add a beautiful climbing rose and a clematis, if you will, uh, onto this fence. And I think you'll be very pleased. A beautiful property. Good luck. To me, this is one of the most refreshing garden spaces at the Chicago Botanic Garden. It's called the Circle Garden. The fountain in the middle, with all of this color around you, well, it's a little piece of paradise. You can see bold ideas here in the way of annuals and foliage plants juxtapose one another. Well, sadly, it's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.